This is the last message in the series called Isn't It Ironic? And just in case you were here for the first time and you're wondering what this possibly could mean, it's, um, it's our little way of saying isn't it ironic. Isn't, cousin, it, it, then an iron that's functional, or at least, yeah, there it is, it's functional. And then the word ick, isn't it ironic? And so this is our last time to blow some steam off. And so that's what we're doing <laughs> because we can. <laughs> What I've said is that this entire series has been in the small Old Testament book of Ruth, and the book of Ruth is full of irony. Uh, things just have that way of, that, that feel of randomness, that feel of that sometimes that things are stacked against us, or sometimes no matter what we do, it turns out poorly, or no matter what we do, it turns out better than what we thought. But that's what the entire series has been dealing with, and today's message deals very much with that last song that Brian did. One man's best day is another man's worst. And that song, if you listen to the lyrics, you know, it's, it's just the way life is. One person is having their very best day. Another person is having their worst. One child is being born. A soldier somewhere is dying. Uh, a song that becomes one person's favorite becomes the most agonizing song to someone else because they were just broken up with. And so there's this irony that seems to go on. One man's best day becomes another one's worst. Now, we're going to look in a minute in the last chapter of Ruth, Ruth chapter 4, and I want to kind of regather the story, and especially important for anyone that's not here. The, the little book of Ruth, it just deals with an ordinary family. There, there's nothing extraordinary. Nobody's doing miracles. Nobody's parting the Red Sea. They're just ordinary people, and they have no awareness whatsoever that God is recording their story. They have no sense that their story matters or is significant at all. It starts with an Israelite family living in Bethlehem. The house of bread is what Bethlehem means. And yet there's a season of famine. And instead of trusting God and staying placed within his boundaries, they leave, they go into Moab, a place where the Israelites were not to go. But they go, they're just going to go for a time. It's a man named Elimelech, his wife Naomi, his two sons Mahlon and Kilion. And they go what they intend to be a short season outside of God's boundaries, thinking they'll get their needs better met that way. And it ends up becoming a lifetime for three of them. Elimelech dies early on. We don't know why. We don't know how. And then the two sons, Malon and Kilion, they marry Moabite women. And ten years later, they also are dead. And this lady named Naomi is just left now destitute in Moab. Her two daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah, she tries to send them back to their Moabite uh, lineage, to their folks, their family, their friends. One goes, one stays, and that's Ruth, and she becomes the star of this entire story. They return to Bethlehem, and life goes on. You might recall that immediately Ruth realizes she has to do something to bring some food into the house, and so she starts going out to the fields nearby and allowing for the peasants, the Israelite law allowed for peasants to gather uh, food from the edges of the fields that people were harvesting, she does so. Just so happens, she goes into the field of a man named Boaz. Boaz is a kin. He's a kinsman redeemer, we'll see later on. He's a relative to Elimelech. He's related to Naomi's family. She just happens to go into his field. If you were here last week, you remember the whole um, proposal story where Naomi coerces uh, Ruth to propose marriage to Boaz because he's the kinsman redeemer, and he agrees to it, but then there's a kink in things. He says, I'm really not the closest kinsman redeemer. There's another family member that actually has the right to the property and a right to marry Ruth and raise up a son to replace the lineage of Malon. And so Boaz says, I'm willing, but I have to see about this other kinsman redeemer. And so that's where the storyline ends. And so, you know, we'll pick up now the closing of the story in chapter 4. Each week I've given you a bit of background, you know, to kind of orient you. And I do this for a couple of reasons, but one is so that when you read the Bible on your own, and I so hope, I'm telling you what I say often, if you are not studying the Word of God on your own during the week, you, you simply are going to be confused spiritually. You're not going to grow the way that God intends. And, and this, as, as good as this is, <laughs> I hope it is, uh, it's not enough. And if you haven't bought a study Bible, we have these wonderful study Bibles today that allow anyone to open the Bible, study. There's great footnotes at the bottom, and God's Word comes alive to you. So that, that's just, you know, a, a part uh, of everything else I'm going to say. Anyway, to orient you, I, I say some things historically so that when you read your Bible, you open it on your own, you kind of know where you're at. So let me give you a little one last time in this. 
Uh, the Israelites, you know, are in Egypt for nearly 400 years in slavery there. God raises up Moses to deliver them out of Egypt. They get right to the border of the promised land in about 18 months. But instead of trusting God, their fear overcomes them. They don't go into the promised land, so they end up wandering around for a total of 40 years. Then, under Joshua, the Lord leads them into the promised land, and after about a 7 to 10 year military campaign, they take most of the promised land. Joshua and that generation die off, and then you enter into this era called the era of the Judges. You have the book of Judges right in your Bible. That's where the book of Ruth takes place. In this era of Judges, it's about a 335 year period. Israel has no king. There's a bit of a leadership vacuum. And so God keeps raising up these individuals that he calls judges. They're military and spiritual leaders to bring his people back to himself. All through the book of Judges, the people drift away from God. They get in trouble. When they get in trouble, they cry out to God to come save them. And he does, just like he does with us, right? We get ourselves in all kinds of messes, um, usually of our own making. And then we cry out to God, God, save me, help me. And he does, ironically. You know, he, he comes and saves us. When in the book of Judges, this cycle happens again and again. And these judges bring the people back to God then as long as the judge is alive, they kind of follow the Lord because the leadership vacuum is filled, but then they drift away again and they get in trouble and they cry out and God raises up yet another judge. All right, when you come to the book of Ruth, you're toward the end of that 335-year era. We know it's toward the end because the book of Ruth is going to point to the lineage of King David. King David is the second and the greatest king of Israel's history. He is in the lineage of Jesus the Messiah, and that's what's being established in this book of Ruth. So now you've got the historical uh, component to this, but I do this because I'm hoping it just soaks, it just brands in your brain, so that when you get home and you open up to the book of Ruth, you're like, oh, yeah, 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 I know where I'm at in biblical history, and, and it's more familiar to you. Okay, now that I've bored you to tears before I go any further. Um, how many of you, assuming that we've all had some good days, and we've all had some bad days. All right, I'm, I'm just going to assume that. How many of you would like to change the equation so that you're almost sure to have more good days than bad days? Is there anyone who would be interested in that if that were feasible? Uh, okay. <laughs> because what I want to suggest that this passage teaches us is that it's not quite as random as it may initially look. Sometimes we just feel like, you know, it's just... It's just a bad day. Bad things are just dumped on us. And sometimes that is true, okay? I want to balance this out. Sometimes that is true. But have you ever noticed that there are certain people, and if they're near you, don't look at them, but uh, every day is a bad day for them. Every day is a new story of whoa, you know, they, they're, they're always getting a bad break. They're always misunderstood. Nothing ever goes right for them. They're always the victim. They're, they're always rejected, you know, and, and when you see them coming, you're almost like, oh, gee, here we go. You know, it's what's coming, you know, and they just want to pour out their newest story of woe, and it just seems like every day is a bad day for them. Now, I'm curious. I ask this in the first service. How many think you know someone like that? Yeah, and if they are near you, <laughs> just kind of giggle. So, what if, what if, and, and this is something I know about you, if you're like me, maybe that's a big assumption, maybe you're not like me, but, but, but some of us that are weird and strange and unusual like me, I always have a sneaky suspicion when I meet people like this that their life is one endless set of bad breaks and tale of woe, their latest crisis, their latest problem. I always have a sneaking suspicion. You know, I kind of think maybe, I think maybe you're bringing some of this on yourself. I, I kind of think maybe this is, has something at least to do with your approach to life or your perspective on life at least and that you're not just this constant victim, that there's, there's, something, there's something that you could do about your perspective, your feelings. Curious, how many of you, when you're around those people, you ever want to kind of say it, but you don't say it. Of course, you're so grace-oriented and compassionate, but you kind of think to yourself, yeah, I, I think you're your own worst enemy. How, how many have that thought go through their head? All right. So we're all on the same page. And it's really hard when you're the one, right? <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> so I think this passage of Scripture opens things up a bit and shows to us that there is actually a reason why some people have more best days and some people have more worst days. Now, again, I want to be, be balanced here. Sometimes it has nothing to do with 
anything that we have or have not done, but sometimes it does. And we can, we can kind of position ourselves. I believe. I think that the Lord is here wanting to reason with us, wanting us to position ourselves so that we are positioned to have more bad, excuse me, more good days than bad days. And this portion of scripture, I think, brings it out. So let, let's get right into the text now. I've kind of given you the background of the story. So now, Boaz has said to Ruth, yes, I will redeem, I want to marry you, but I can't because there's this other relative that's closer than I, and he has the right to you and to redeem Elimelech's uh, property before I do, so if I can, I will, but I have to go to this person first. So Ruth chapter 4. It says, Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat there. When the kinsman redeemer he had mentioned came along, now isn't it interesting that he just happens to come along? Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and he sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, sit here. They did so. Then he said to the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our brother Elimelech. That was Naomi's former husband. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me, so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you and I am next in line. The guy's response, I will redeem it. Pause. If the story ends here, this really is a twist. Because, you know, up to this point, it's Ruth and it's Boaz. They want to be together. They want to be married. They have kind of believed, I think, that God's hand has, like, brought them together. He's ready to marry her. And this guy says, no, I'll do it. Really spoils the story. <laughs> but it doesn't end there. So let's go on. He says, I I'll redeem it. Then Boaz said, uh, on the day you buy the land from Naomi and from Ruth the Moabitess, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the kinsman redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now, in the earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other, this was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the kinsman redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself. And he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and the people, today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion and Malon, that were the two sons of Naomi. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabitess, Malon's widow, as my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from his family, from among his family or from the town records. Today you are witnesses. Then the elders and all those at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah. These were the ones that had the 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel, who together built up the house of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, a very weird story in Genesis 38 sometime, read it on your own. So Boaz, so Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. Then he went to her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive. Interesting, she was married to Malon for 10 years, no children. The Lord enabled her to conceive. Um, she gave birth to a son. The woman said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, meaning Ruth, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son. Not really, it was a grandson. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of who? David. And we'll just kind of end there. So they've established the lineage of King David. And what's interesting is that Ruth, this Gentile, this non-Israelite, 
becomes a follower of God, puts her faith in the God of Israel, becomes a convert, and she is in the lineage of the Messiah. No accident. No accident here. God's making a point that he ultimately intends to call people from every nationality and every part of humanity to himself, all that will trust him and follow him fully forever. Anyway, when you look at this portion of Scripture, the difference, I believe, between one man's best day and another man's worst, that we can get on the side of the equation where we have more of the best days than the worst, and I know we all want that, it revolves around two things. Choices. Choices that we're all capable of making, And choices that if we make consistently, I'm convinced we'll have more more good days than bad days. Here's what the choices are. We have to choose, first of all, principle, and let me add eternal principle over temporal pragmatism. Principle over pragmatism. When you really look at this conversation between Boaz and this nameless, shoeless guy, and if you want to look into this whole shoeless thing from an interesting light sometime on your own, look up Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 through 10, and uh, it it brings this whole shoeless matter into a slightly different light. Don't do it now. You'll just miss the rest of the message. But anyway, um, this guy, he's... He's ready to do this deal when it sounds like on the surface, when he first hears about it, you know, Boaz says, hey, you know, here's the deal. You can, you're right in line to get Elimelech's property. He's like, sure, yeah, sounds good to me. And then later on when when he finds out, but it involves Ruth the Moabitess in having a son who will then keep carrying on the lineage of Malon, not necessarily this nameless shoeless guy, He instantly changes, instantly. What are we looking at with this guy? What's going through his mind? How does he approach life? How does he think? How does he make decisions? And each and every one of us, as we sit here today, we kind of have an interior grid. We have a philosophy. We have a governing style, an approach to how we make decisions, how we view life. First of all, when you look at this guy, the thing that jumps off the page is to him, this is like a business deal. It's, he's taking a businessman's approach. He's thinking in very temporal terms, pragmatism. He's thinking like, is this interesting to me? Do I, do I see anything desirable in this? Uh, can, can this work somehow for me? Uh, can I get some benefit? Is this useful to me? He approaches life from the standpoint of what can this do for me? Am I interested? Uh, can this work out somehow beneficially to me? Will it fulfill some desire? Do I find it useful? And many people approach life just like that without even thinking it through very clearly. It's just, you know, what what is this going to do for me, essentially? He really doesn't seem to be the slightest bit concerned with something that God has set up. The term kinsman redeemer just keeps popping up in this passage. This, This term redemption and redeemer. Where does this come from? Well, at first, you find it in Exodus chapter 6, verse 6. It's where God starts talking about taking his people out of the Egyptian bondage and bringing them to himself, turning them into a nation uh, of his very own. He, he talks about he's going to redeem them. You have it again in Exodus 13, verses 12 through 15, when on that night when the death angel is going to go through Egypt and God's going to separate his people from the Egyptians and the first son in every household will, will die unless there is this peculiar ceremony carried out Uh, the Israelites are told you're to take a blood of a spotless lamb you're to take that lamb kill it slay it put its blood on the top of the doorpost and on the sides and if you have the blood of the spotless lamb on your doorpost when the death angel goes through your firstborn son won't die you'll be redeemed everybody that was under the blood of the lamb was safe everybody that was not was not safe redemption you get into the New Testament, of course, it's talked about consistently. We have in Ephesians 1, 7, it says that, that Jesus gives us redemption, even the forgiveness of our sins through his blood. So redemption is something sacred. All through the book of Ruth, it's talked about the kinsman redeemer, redemption. Boaz, I want to suggest, approached life very differently than this unnamed shoeless guy. He approached life as sacred. He realized that redemption, although he didn't realize all the theological implications, because redemption is ultimately God's statement in advance that in order to unify and harmonize the universe of free moral agents, angels and humans, to bring us to the place where we are all in unity with what is good and with God, 
It's going to cost God a sacrifice. Before he ever created an angel, before he ever created a human, God knew that in order to take free-willed beings, free moral agents, and bring them into chosen, chosen harmony with what is right and good, chosen harmony with himself, it would call for God himself to make a sacrifice. The sacrifice of Jesus was not an afterthought. God, before he created anything, always knew that it was going to take the sacrifice of the Son of God to bring the universe to the conclusion that our God is totally good. He's totally trustworthy. He's totally loving. Everyone can do no better than to trust him and obey him consistently, always. And the scripture says that someday the universe will be eternally harmonized because of God's great redeeming work. Boaz didn't certainly know all of this, but he did know one thing, I'm convinced, that redemption was sacred. He had saw it in the scripture. He saw it in Israel's history. He knew that this had something to do with God and his entire approach to life and to this incident was a godly approach. And he had a very different screening mechanism, I believe, in his mind. I think his approach to life was pretty simple. And I hope that it's the approach to life that, that each of us has in place in here. I think it was as simple as Boaz looked at life and said, you know, what is the right thing to do in the sight of God? What does God say about this? What does God's word say about this? What has he revealed about this? What would God have me to do? That's pretty simple. The other, the other approach, you know, is this going to benefit me? Is this interesting? Is this desirable? Is this profitable? Is this useful? Uh, can I get anything out of this? Uh, is there going to be any pain? Is, is this going to be, you know, pain-free? Is this going to be pleasurable? You've got to think an awful lot. There's a lot of scheming. There's a lot of moving around mentally. There's a lot of looking at various angles in your decision-making process if you're a pragmatist, a temporal pragmatist. Temporal pragmatist is an individual that just says, you know, I don't know how long I'm here alive, and I want to be happy. And so, you know, I have a few opportunities to be happy, so I'm going to view life from the standpoint, what can I do now? What opportunity lies in front of me now that might make me happy now? But an individual that's living life based on eternal principle says, what does God say about this? Because God's right is always right God's will is always good. His ways are necessary for the unity and the harmony and the blessedness of all free moral agents in the universe forever. And so the, the question becomes, what does God say? What is right? What, is, what does God say is good? Boaz approached life as being sacred, all of life. I think when you look at his conversations with his men in the field, Always, always, the Lord's in the middle of the talk. It's very comfortable. It's very sincere. It comes across appropriate. Each of us, if we would follow his model, would do well. And we'd have, I'm, I'm completely convinced, more of those good days than bad days if we approach life as sacred. That means that, that when you go to work and when you were late and when you're just doing recreation and when you're buying and selling or thinking or, or just relaxing, that every part of life becomes sacred every part of life is joyfully lived under the leadership of God the scripture says in Colossians 3 23 it says do all things heartily as unto the Lord in the context in that particular verse it's talking about our work uh, even working for you know un unjust uh, circumstances and bosses and so on so Boaz approached life as sacred the unnamed shoeless guy approach life as secular he's like what, what's in it for me what can I get out of it and we see this by how unprincipled he was how quickly he changed yes I'll redeem it oh I gotta marry Ruth and I gotta raise the son no I won't redeem it no that that might hurt my my inheritance so he backs off it listen to some scripture from the book of Proverbs and one from Romans that just reinforced this idea of principle governed living what is right in the sight of God and I hope I so hope that everyone in this room that's the question that, that reflexively just comes to our mind. When you face a decision, when you face a crossroad, when you face a situation, what does God say about this? What is right in his sight? Um, because that is the way to have more good days than bad. And more importantly, that's the only way life can work. Proverbs says this. It says, the integrity of the upright does something for them. What does it do? It guides them. 
the, the human being that says, what is right in the sight of God? What is the good in this? God, what would you have me to do? That guides us in our decisions. It guides us through life, our integrity, principle governed living. Not, not this pragmatic, flexible, relative kind of stuff. It says the integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful, that's the person that's always wheeling and dealing and what can I get out of it? But the unfaithful are destroyed by what? Their duplicity. It's the idea they've, they've got all these options. They've got all these, these things going around and it ends up just, you know, caving in on them and destroying them. It says in Proverbs 12, 5, it says, the plans of the righteous are just principled living. The righteousness, or excuse me, righteousness guards the man of integrity. There, there's a protective mechanism when you're just going through life. What's the right thing to do? What, what does God say? That's what I'm going to do. I trust him. It says in Proverbs 21, 21, he who pursues righteousness, what is right in the sight of God, that's what righteousness means, and love finds life, prosperity, and honor. And that's what we see happening with Boaz. Boaz is a guy that he is just pursuing what is right in the sight of God, and he's pursuing love. He wants to bless Naomi. He wants to bless Ruth. He wants, he wants to give. He doesn't want to take. And consequently, he ends up being blessed. And on that best day side of the equation, another man's worst. You know, just to push back for a second, here was Boaz and this unnamed shoeless guy and they're going through this transaction with utter, without any awareness, they're utterly unaware that what they were doing mattered in the sight of heaven as deeply as it turns out it did. This guy wrote himself out of the Bible. It, the whole story could have been differently had he had the heart of Boaz, had he approached this as, as a godly, redemptive issue, he could have been the one that we were looking toward today as a model. He could have been the one that for generation after generation of human history would have been moving people toward God, but he wrote himself out of God's redemptive story. He wasn't aware that the stakes were so high. You've got to hear this. You and I face multiple decisions uh, usually every day, we have roles, we have relationships, we have responsibilities, we have all kinds of decisions. That, you know, we have to choose this or not choose that. And we, generally speaking, have very little awareness of the magnitude of these things. We kind of feel kind of ordinary. We're just facing the crowd. You know, it all happens rather swiftly. And this book is telling us, it's screaming at us, no ordinary lives, no unimportant people, no unimportant decisions, no unimportant approaches to life. God's recording things. It matters. Not recording like some angry judge, but recording like when we do the slightest bit of faith, faithful activity toward him, toward others, loving activity, stuff that we forget, we don't even think about. It matters. It's going to ring true for eternity. It really matters. So Romans 12 in the New Testament just adds to this whole idea of choosing principle over pragmatism. It says, be careful... Do what is right in the eyes of everybody. Here it is again. Principle governed living. Doing what is right. 2 Thessalonians 3.13, it says, Never tire of doing what is right. And it's easy to get tired of it sometimes because when you and I have to interact with people that are wheeling and dealing and scheming and conning and they've got all these options, they can lie, they can connive, they can do all these things. Sometimes it gets tiresome to just be that person that just says, I'm just going to do the right thing. I'm just going to, it's going to cost me. It's not going to be convenient, but I'm just going to do the right thing in the sight of God. And we can tire of that sometimes. I'll tell you a story about a guy named Leon. Leon was uh, living around 1911. He was, uh, I think he was around 38 years old at that time. And he lived in Maine. And uh, Leon was just a regular guy. He loved to hunt, loved to fish. He loved the outdoors. And he was outdoors an awful lot. And when he would go out, he would get aggravated when he's hunting and fishing that his boots would always get wet. You know, it's like, what a drag. You know, your feet get wet, they get cold, you're living in Maine. And so he comes up with this idea. He, he figures, I think, I think I could figure out how to make a boot that was waterproof, which in 1911 was a really unique idea. So sure enough, Leon goes to a cobbler, you know, and he gives his design and finds some materials. And uh, he has a waterproof boot made. Well, he's so excited about it, he, he takes all of his worldly funds, and he gets 400 of these things made. He gets a listing of people that come into the state of Maine to hunt and fish and gets permission to mail them out this little advertisement for this brand new, very innovative product that a hunter or fisherman would be interested in, a waterproof boot. Well, they, they sell immediately. He sells all 400 of them. 
Here's the interesting thing about Leon. Leon now is becoming a businessman. And he puts into his sale package one little caveat. If you are not entirely satisfied with this product, I will give you 100% back. If it's in any way unsatisfactory, I will give you 100% of your money back. Well, he sends out his boots, and lo and behold, about 90% of them leak. The people return them, and they want their money back. Now, Leon is a new business guy. He's, he's taken all of his worldly wealth just to get this thing started. Now he has to take these faulty boots back, give the people their money back, and now he has a decision to make. Does he go on with his business life? Does he stop? He could have even made a decision prior to that. Do I really follow up on this? Do I really give them their money back? But Leon did. And now, this just this past year, Leon's company brought in $1.5 billion. Leon, Leon Wood Bean, L.L. Bean is the story. And why was he such a success? He died in like 1967 in Florida. Because of integrity. To this day, you buy something from Bean, you know, money back guarantee if you don't like the product, if you're not satisfied with it. The whole company, people that have this notion that you have to wheel and deal and scheme and be some shifty pragmatist to make it in business or in life, it's nonsense. It's nonsense. It's just not so. Uh, God's ways may be a little slower, and you may have to absorb some cost, but God's ways are always the right way ultimately. So if we really want to end up on the more good side day of the equation than bad side, good days than bad days, we've got to be willing to choose principle, principle over pragmatism. Let's just pause a minute. Come on, let's, let's get serious. What is the set of questions in place when we face decisions? They come swiftly every day. Is it just a reflex? What does God say about this? What is right in the sight of God? Or is it, well, gee, I don't know. Do I like it? Um, can I get anything out of it? Would it be painful? Would it be costly? Would, you know, is, it, is it interesting? Is it desirable? I mean, do we have all these mechanisms of questions or the one simple one? Because if we want to be on that good side of the equation, God's calling us to simplify things. And I'll tell you something else. You'll have a whole lot more mental peace. You'll have inter, uh, internal synergy. You, you know, all your thoughts and emotions and feelings and things come together. It's, it's beneficial in many ways. All right. We have to choose principle over pragmatism. And the second thing we see Boaz doing is, is he picks people over profit. Because listen, the no-name one-shoe guy... He was all for redeeming until he heard it, it involved Ruth and raising up a son. And then he's like, oh, man, no, th this would be a threat to my estate. That, his very words. He is looking at his profit margin. He's looking at what it's going to cost him. Whereas Boaz, it never entered in. He, he's just like, you know, this is what God, this is sacred redemption. It's God's will. He's put me in this place. Uh, I don't care what it costs. If, if I'm in a position to bless Naomi and to bless Ruth, and, and if God's going to allow me, because at this stage, Boaz was unmarried. He had no children. If God's going to allow me to raise up a son, um, who cares? I want to bless people. I want to be pleasing to God. I don't care about what it's going to cost me. And that's a really important choice, again, that we have to make. And it's not, it's not nearly as easy as it sounds on the surface. You know, there's the old statement, we are to love people and use things. How many have ever heard this statement? Love people, use things. I'm just curious. Anybody ever heard it? Oh, it's new to you then. Okay, it's an old statement. Trust me on that. I'm old. It's, it's been around. <laughs> but often it gets reversed. We love things and use people. We all know people that use people. Some people's entire life is about positioning other people, using other people, getting out of other people what they want. Some use people and love things. Love things. Will devote their life to things, inanimate objects, and use people even to get things. But the equation that God has written inside of us, if we, if we get close to that image that's left of God in us, the instinct is to love people and use things. And, and that's what we see Boaz doing. We see Boaz is, is a man of the spirit. He's a man of God. And when the choice comes up with profit or, or people that he can help and bless, 
to him, there's no choice whatsoever. What about you and I? Do, do we have the clarity, the spiritual clarity on that matter that Boaz had? Because if we get clear on that matter and we settle on the side of the equation, I'm always going to choose people over things we're going to have more good days than bad. Now, it's not as easy, it's not nearly as easy as, as it may sound because we, we, we have these ways of um, justifying things. For example, we all know the, um, the common theme that's in, you know, America these days where the family says, well, you know, I had it bad when I grew up and so I'm going to make sure my kids don't have it as bad as I had it. So dad and mom work tirelessly and, and of course they're never around and they don't give the kids any attention but, but their kids have a better house and better clothing and better cars and, and we're doing it all for our kids. We're doing it all for our kids. And the kids are like, ah, we hate you, mom and dad. You're never around. You don't love us. You know, you don't talk with us. But we're doing this because we love you. You know, and, and we get into this craziness. Now, now, I'm not trying to say that there isn't validity. I'm trying to show how complicated this gets. There's certainly validity to trying to uh, improve your children's life over yours and to see that their material needs are met. But it's a real weird balancing act to make sure that we're doing what's really good for them uh, and as opposed to serving things. Let, let me let Scripture speak a little bit. Jesus, on the last night that he was with his disciples, in John chapter 13, 34, he said, a new command I give you. And then he says, love one another. Well, that was really not a new command. You have that all through the Old Testament. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. That was really not new, but he wasn't finished. He says, a new command I give you. Love one another. Now here comes the nuance. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. When Jesus said this, he was probably less than 12 hours from going to the cross. He tried to get his disciples to understand that. They couldn't, they couldn't accept it. Jesus knew he was going to display for them what this differing kind of love was going to look like. He was going to hang on the cross, be tortured, paying for their sins, my sins, your sins, the sins of the world. And they were going to see visibly a different kind of a love, a sacrificial love. And, and, and there's something that I want to say. When Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sins and your sins... He didn't die for me when I was at my best. The scripture says that he died for us when we were at our worst. When I was this young individual for 23 years that couldn't care less about God, who broke every one of his laws that was imaginable, who used his name as a cuss word, the Bible says that it was when I was in that condition, when I didn't care or like God at all, had no interest in him, it was then that Jesus died for me. Now, much more so now that he's won my heart and I love him and I follow him. But we need to get this deep down absorbed inside of us that, that Jesus died for sinful, ungrateful people. People that didn't care anything about God or good. That's the depth of his love. And he says, Here, here's the model of the kind of love that I want you to have. It's a sacrificial love. And it's not a sacrificial for love for people that deserve it. It's a sacrificial love for people that do not deserve it. As I have loved uh, love one another, as I have loved you. Now, the book of 1 John, which is written by the Apostle John, much, much later after the Gospel of John, uh, John, led by the Holy Spirit, elevates this, expands this a bit. He says, look, whoever loves his brother lives in the light, means in God's light, and there's nothing in him to make him stumble. Now he's going to kind of unpack it a bit. He says, look, do not love the world or anything in the world. No, he's not talking about the world of people here. He's talking about the cosmos. He's talking about the system of values and trends and practices of society at any given time in history. He says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, the boasting of what he has and what he does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. Isn't it an interesting thing? You get in a conversation with somebody new, almost immediately the subject comes out. What do you do? What do you do? Where do you live? You, you know. Now, I'm not saying that it's always bad. You know, sometimes it's just ice breaking, but that's the very thing that the Scripture says that people are absorbed about. Oh, look what I have, and, and look what I do. And the Scripture says, but that's not it. That's, that's not where God's at. He expands it yet further in the third chapter in the same book of 1 John. He says, look, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ, or Jesus the Messiah, laid down his life for us. Here it is again. We ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Now, he doesn't mean necessarily dying uh, for one another. He's going to explain what he means. If anyone has material possessions 
and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? He's saying, when, when you see with your own eyes a fellow Christian who is in dire need and you can meet that need, and sometimes what they need is to be rebuked and learn to be responsible, but sometimes they need physical help and we don't meet it, he's saying that, that's, not, that's not following through on the love of God. He says, if anyone has material possessions, sees his brother is in need, but he has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with word or tongue, but with actions and in truth. The one shoe no-name guy, when it came down to cost, he balks. And he is written out of God's redemptive story. And his life becomes null and void for all that we can tell. Boaz chose people. He didn't care about the cost. He saw an opportunity to bless and to minister to people. Jesus giving a warning about this whole pull between material things and, and the love of God and people. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, he says, Look, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money or God and materialism. There's going to be two pulls. 1 Thessalonians 3, 12, it says, May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else. This, these are those outside. So our love for fellow Christians, but our love for people in general, those that are even outside of the faith, it ought to be growing. It ought to be increasing, just as ours does. And then 1 Corinthians 16, 14 just kind of sums it all up. It says, hey, look, do everything in love. Do everything in love. And that's not this kind of Hollywood love, okay? Uh, you, you know, the, when the scripture's talking about it, love, the word that is used there, it's the idea that I am, I am unselfishly devoted to the highest well-being and happiness of the other person in light of God's truth. It is not this fuzzy, you know, weak-willed, uh, shifty, you know, sort of love that, that is more self-centered than it is other-centered. So, we see Boaz choosing principle over pragmatism and choosing people over profit. He probably had none of these notions going through his head. It was just who he was. He was someone that trusted God, walked with God. God's value system was built inside of him. And that's, that's what we're talking about here when we're talking about the difference between choosing people and profit. It's about values. And God is the only one who is in a position to tell us what is actually always important. That's what values are. What is actually always important are people. God created people in his own image. Jesus died for people. God loves people. When you and I invest in the life of a human being in any way, shape, or form, we're investing in eternal stuff. And so that's always more important than any convenience or, you know, temporary profit that we might gain for ourselves. So when we close this story out, the thing that comes to my mind is, you know, like... <laughs> If it was me in the story, if it was you in the story, for real, which one would we be? I, I mean, seriously, faced with the kinds of choices that the players in this story were faced with, would you and I come out like Boaz, really? Would we? I hope. Or would we come out like the nameless, shoeless guy? Or the one shoe guy. Now, I'm not saying the one shoe guy was a bad man, necessarily. But when he had an opportunity to be written into the story of God's redemptive work to bless generation after generation, he didn't make the cut. And he didn't make the cut because it was clear to me what was going on inside this guy. He was a pragmatist and he was a profiteer. Are we people of principle? that sacrificially are devoted to people, made in the image of God, or, or are we um, pragmatic profiteers? If the story involved you or I, which, which character? Which character would you be? I want to close with a story that comes from the Civil War. I thought it was interesting for a few reasons. It, it shows uh, the principles that this message talked about, but it, but it also shows this thing that covers the whole book of Ruth. The whole book of Ruth is full of, isn't it interesting that that happened? The book of Ruth is just full of God's activity, and yet it really never says directly that it's God's activity, and that's the way life tends to be. Think about it. This backslidden Israelite family happens to move into Moab. Uh, the two sons happen to marry Moabite women. 
they happened after 10 years not to have any kids. One of the Moabite women happens to turn out to be a devoted follower of the God of Israel and leaves her whole old life behind to go back to Israel. When they get back to Israel, to Bethlehem, Ruth happens to mosey into the field of Boaz, the kinsman redeemer. When the proposal Ruth gives to Boaz is presented, he happens to accept it. And he happens to have never been married to this point. He happens to have never had any kids. He goes to the town center and happens to meet the kinsman redeemer. I don't know that he's seen this guy for years, but the guy happens to come there. And they happen to end up married. And then, mysteriously, Ruth happens suddenly to be able to conceive. You see, God is all over this story. Ordinary people, ordinary life, all over it. They had no sense of it, I'm convinced. And that's the way God works. That's why we're called to walk by faith and not by sight. That's why he allows us to be tested in all kinds of small and large ways. But he's all over. He's all over your life story. And some of you, like me, you can look back now and you can see all these things that just happened to happen and you see God's hand. Let me tell you a story of another something that just happened to happen. The, um, the Battle of Williamsburg during the Civil War, May uh, 1862. Terrible, bloody battle as so many of the Civil War battles were. And when it was over, there was um, one... Yankee or Union chaplain that started to survey the field. Now let me back up and tell you a little more about this story. The story is told by a guy named Fred Penny about his grandmother's house in South Carolina. Uh, he says that on the wall, one of the walls in the house is just covered with pictures, just numerous pictures of all the various generations and family members and so on. And he says that right in the middle of the wall, though, in South Carolina, you know, rebel country, <laughs> was this picture of a Union a uh, Union soldier on a horseback. He said that when he was a little kid, he asked his grandmother, what's that? What's that? Who, who is he? Because he appeared to be the center, the focal point. And she said, you're too young, really, to, uh, to understand. And, of course, when you tell a kid they're too young to understand, what do they want to do? They really want to know. A few years went by. He was staring at the picture. She came in, and he said, I'd really like to know the story. She said, okay. So she tells the story. After the Battle of Williamsburg, bloody battle, this Union chaplain started surveying the field because, you know, they had sought to pick up all the dead bodies, you know, and, and take care of all the wounded that could be taken care of, but he was taking one last perusal of it. And as he's going along, he happens upon this Confederate soldier, a young Confederate, 19-year-old, just a kid. It's always been kids that fight the wars of the world. Uh, and he's terrified, and he's shaking, and he's obviously bleeding to death. His leg is almost severed from some sort of a blast and this chaplain comes upon him union chaplain and he picks him up and he puts him on his horse takes him back to the uh, the union medical tents and they work on him now the best thing they could do in those days they amputated his leg but they stopped the bleeding in that process he becomes a friend to this young uh, confederate soldier who was his enemy and the friendship continues I'm going to give you the name of this guy, this Union um, chaplain. His name was Joseph Twitchell. He was a pastor in the military. He was a pastor after that for the rest of his life. The young man that he rescued that day, the uh, Confederate soldier, his name was William Moffat Greer, and he becomes the great-grandfather of this young man, Fred Penny, the little child who's asking his grandmother about who's this individual on the wall. William Moffat Greer also becomes a pastor. And these two men who were enemies become lifelong friends, serving God, serving people. Isn't it interesting that he just happened to come upon the one Christian man that laid there dying? And he just happened, based on principle, to do the right thing. And he just happened to put a person's life above a war going on. And he lays his own reputation on the line to save this young Confederate soldier. And they become lifelong friends and blessings to many in their congregations for years to come. Just, just happened to happen that way. When we are walking with God by living principle-centered lives, and when we're loving people over things, God can easily guide us and guard us 
And we end up with more of those good day stories than bad day stories. So in closing, which side of this equation would you be on? This story is all about kinsman redeemer. You know, what, uh, what Boaz was a type of was, of course, fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus, God, the eternal son takes on human flesh and becomes the true kinsman redeemer. He becomes human to convince humanity once and for all that he can be trusted, that his leadership is always based on love and on righteousness. He sacrifices himself for our sins. He pours out his life. There's nothing more that Jesus can do. There's nothing more that he will do. If what Jesus has done is not enough to convince you and I that he is trustworthy and worthy to be followed fully forever, there's nothing more that can be done. So has Jesus... Like Boaz in this story, has Jesus become your kinsman redeemer? I mean, have, have you made the choice to put your faith in him and follow him fully forever? Or, or are you still kind of on that fringe where you try to use Jesus? You know, you kind of you get a little in trouble and you try to use him and you call him up and all that sort of thing. Or, or are you the real deal? I mean, ha, have you just had your heart conquered by this God who is totally, utterly worthy and you will pass every test that life throws your way because you trust him and no matter what life dishes that trust will be manifested which which side of the coin are you on and and if you're on the side that you don't want to be on it's a loving god that's brought you here today and warmed your heart so you can make a choice that will be uh, beneficial to you and to everyone that knows you for eternity so let, let's let's pray father we want to thank you for uh this story of these people of so long ago, people that were just like us, just ordinary, probably had no clue that their lives mattered at all, and yet heaven was, was so focused on them. Thank you for this reminder that there are no insignificant people, no inconsequential events in our life that we matter to you, and that every choice of righteousness and principle and faithfulness and love matters. And how I pray, Father, that if any of us need, need our inner um, decision-making mechanism changed, that we'll do it today before we leave here. And if there's anyone here that's never put their faith in you, Lord Jesus, how I pray that your spirit will do what only he can do to convince them of the, the, the best thing that they could possibly do is to trust in you. I ask it in your name. Amen.